This program airs statewide on California Public Television and is a California's Gold classic. It was the very first U.S. naval establishment on the entire Pacific coast. Admiral Farragut himself took command in 1854. Now, in the very early days, things were fairly quiet, but soon Mare Island Naval Shipyard was a bustling place, building and repairing ships, not only from the U.S. Navy, but from Russia, France, England, and other nations as well. Located in Northern California, a little northeast of San Francisco, Mare Island was a perfect place for a naval shipyard. And over the years, the facilities grew, not only in size, but in importance as well. They built and repaired battleships and heavy cruisers and all sorts of other ships for all our wars. They built submarines too, a lot of them, including a dozen nuclear subs. In fact, through its long and colorful history, the men and women of this shipyard have built over 500 craft and overhauled literally thousands more. Mare Island Naval Shipyard has a rich history, 142 years of service by thousands of military and civilian personnel. Today, that proud record is in the history books because the shipyard is officially closed part of our nation's military downsizing. But a few months before it closed, we visited this place, not only to pay our respects to its past, but to see for ourselves this wonderful example of California's gold. We got our first view of the shipyard from a helicopter and discovered that even though Mare Island originally was an island, these days, because the north end has been filled in, it's a peninsula located right across Mare Island Strait from the city of Vallejo. Mare Island is 3.5 miles long by one mile wide, over 5,600 acres counting the wetlands. These days, it's reachable by two different bridges in the early days, you had to take a ferry boat over. Back on ground, we drove in over the Mare Island Causeway on a cloudy morning, which quickly turned into a beautiful day. And driving around that old shipyard, it didn't take long to get the feeling of being completely surrounded by history. Lots of wonderful old buildings and tree-lined streets. We started our tour in one of the oldest parts of the shipyard, right on the water where for 142 years, naval history was made. And here we are right here in front of what has to be dry dock number one, the oldest dry dock in the state of California. Uh, and and on, on the west coast, on the west coast. Now what's the story behind this thing? They wanted to build a base that could represent the United States government on the west coast. And of course, in order to do that, they still had to have uh, a dry dock, a place where they could bring in and repair the ship. So they, they built this dry dock, and this was the first one on the west coast, which made it uh, a center place for the whole activity on the, on the Navy Yard. Now, what kind of ships would have been built in this dry dock back, I guess, starting in the 1860s, 1870s? all kinds of ships limited only by their length, the length of the dry dock and the depth. And so we've had cruisers, uh, we've had uh, battle damage ships from World War II, we've had garbage lighters, we've had submarines, and we've even had uh, yachts in his bill. What so about all in the old days, what would have been in here? In the, back in the 1800s? Yeah, back in the 1800s, they had what they call wooden ships and iron men. So they would be wooden ships that would be docked in the, of all descriptions. This whole dry dock was built more or less by hand. The dry dock itself was built. It's by not concrete, see, it's granite. And the granite really? came from the mountain. It's not concrete, it's granite. And those granite blocks are set in like a, an arch to support the, the, the pressure. So they cut the granite they to cut. make this dry dock. On the site. They brought the blocks in and cut the granite on the site to fit. Wow. 
Wow. And it took several, eight to ten years to get the dock finished. And it was excavated with uh, horses and Fresno shovels and that sort of thing. There are pictures to validate that. So when this was built, this was a big deal. Believe me, this was a big deal. Now, would there have been activity all the way down here, all the way down to that crane, is the far crane down there? Well, uh, down at, well, you're saying the far crane, that's down at the finger piers, which were built during World War II. And it was a hub of activity. Uh, the shops, the dry docks, the building ways. This was almost the main street hauling material back and forth from the, uh, the construction shops to the building ways. We're standing here looking at your scrapbook. The date was Saturday, October 23rd, 1965. What happened right here on that date? Because I know you remember it. Well, I, I do remember it because I kind of had an a important part around it. But it was the 507th ship that was launched on Mare Island. Rear Admiral Fay was the uh, shipyard commander, and it was our eighth Polaris submarine. And on the day of launch, it it was a big fiesta day because the M.G. Vallejo was named after Mariano, early settler um, Guadalupe Vallejo, after the town of Vallejo, and it became not only a, a local Vallejo, but it was a whole area. And on that day, we even had the, uh, the Mexican consulate come up. We had all of the Congress people, the senators, the politicians, uh, the, everybody that was interested in Mayor Island came here that day and it was a beautiful day. The, the crews and, and the working people were dressed in period costume. I had on a uh, Spanish with a flat hat and the gals all had on dresses. Now I've seen pictures of the whole side of the hill over there was full of people from the town to watch this thing. It was thing. an ideal, ideal spot to watch it and uh, you would stand on or sit or bringing your children down on the, on the marina on the Vallejo side. On the other side, on, over there. On the, on the Vallejo side. And uh, actually, you got a better sight or a better shot of the launching when it came into the water. Was there always a big cheer from the crowd oh, when it and, went and in? And the whistle blowing, the church bells ring, uh, kids were crying and all that stuff. They didn't know what was happening. Really? But it, it was a fiesta. It was a really, a, truly a fiesta day. You get the keel, you build it, you launch it, and then you outfit it and you have it sea trials and, and say goodbye to it and then you go to work on another one. Now we've made a quick trip across Mare Island Strait because you all wanted to show me these. They just look like regular sheds to me but they really have quite a history to them, don't they? Yeah, they do because they are called coaling sheds and that's where they stored the coal that fuel the coal burning ships. And of course, I always thought, well, how did the coal get there in the first place? So schooners that applied up and down California brought the coal, and then they put it into those sheds for transportation aboard the naval ships. So that would have been back before the turn of the century, in the late 1800s. Well, before, yeah, but when you talk about before the turn of the century, before uh, there was oil burning power for the ships. And then, of course, you went from the coal to the oil to diesel. To, to nuclear power. Now that brings up the point, nuclear power, right down here. Yeah, you had a lot of lot nuclear of power here. Right, well we had, well, that's where we, they uh, repowered the nuclear ships in those dry docks. So was this a secret, a top secret area? Did people who lived around here know what went on over there on Mare Island? Vaguely. Vaguely, I don't, if, if they had husbands and wives who worked over there, they were pretty mute-mouthed about it. Uh-huh. So the whole thing was pretty much top secret. Well, in, during the war, we were taught that uh, loose lips sink ships. And I think the same applied to what was going on at Mare Island. Uh, there was a need to know before you really told people anything that was going on. Yeah, but this went on long after the war. We're talking about nuclear submarines now. Well, nuclear submarines were just one factor. There were many other things that were classified, as we call them, and we still don't talk about some of those things because they're still classified. Like what kind of things? <laughs> he told you, he can't that, talk to that's you. That's that's no, I'm serious, <laughs> I, because this is part of the history of Mare Island. Uh, yes, some of it is experimentation. A lot of top secret stuff going on over there? Continually, continually. Really? Yeah. 
Yes, it was, and that's why it's top secret. That's why I could stand here all day and you all aren't going to tell me. You got it. <laughs> you got it. Well, some of Mare Island's history is still classified, but most of it isn't. And believe me, this shipyard is full of neat places to visit. In fact, a rather large number of its buildings are designated National Historic Landmarks, like these wonderful old homes built for the officers and their families back at the turn of the century. Now we have come to a part of the shipyard that is, you'd feel like you were in mid-America uh, on some tree-lined residential street. Right, right, yes. These houses are built at the turn of the century. They replace old brick ones that fell apart during an earthquake that we had. Uh -huh. So these are all built about 1900. And who would have lived in a house like this? Oh, the commandant, the big boss, the admiral. Of the, of the shipyard? The whole base, yes. Wow, this is a, it's a beautiful area. Now, were you all, when you were working here, ever allowed to come over here? Well, we were because we came at the new age of the new, uh, uh, of the officers. But in the early days, the workmen would tell me that uh, no civilians were allowed on, uh, on this street. This was officer country. And when the workmen came up to uh, do maintenance in, in the, uh, in, in the quarters that they were required to take their shoes off. It was interesting because this, some of these are larger properties and the, the early word was that, uh, that if you were a lieutenant commander and above, you were then able to keep two cows. So that made the property larger. If you were under a lieutenant commander, you only could keep one cow. It was sort of a, a class distinction in that. It's, it's a show place and this park is, is kind of central. Look at this. Well, supposedly uh, these trees and the vines and the plants came from all over the word, world. As the ship's captains would come in, they'd pick up seeds in Java, uh, foreign countries, and they'd bring them over and give them to, to the commandant of the shipyard. Uh, this was sort of a mutual exchange pack. And many of these trees go right back to uh, Admiral Farragut and his immediate successor days when they, they, they some, of the, some of the officers were very uh, horticultural conscious, uh, you might say. So the ship captains would bring... Bring trees and shrubs, uh, fruits, berries into the shipyard and they would present them. Some, some of them flourished and of course some of them just slipped away. It wasn't the right, right climatic condition. Wow, this is beautiful. Oh, it, it is neat. I, we're hoping, I guess, that this part of the shipyard will be preserved as sort of a, a, a little oasis of what Mare Island was at, and in past years. One of the most interesting places on the entire island is the base cemetery, which is almost as old as the shipyard itself and provides some fascinating insight into Mare Island history. Now, who is, who is buried here? There are people here from all over the world. Well, in the early days when foreign ships would come in for repairs or replenishment, some of the crews would, would pass away. And as a courtesy, they interred them here. And there are Chinese, there are Russians. Now, what were the Russians doing here? The Russians were in here on the ship, and a, and a beside is that in 1906, when they had the earthquake in San Francisco in April, uh, the Russians sent a contingency of their, of their crew down to help support or fight the, the disaster. And six of them perished in the fire that followed the earthquake. And they are interred in this cemetery. Now the marker just says, well there's one right there, it just says Russian sailor. Evidently, they didn't get his name on the record or it was buried under adverse circumstances or something, but they identified him as a Russian sailor. Now this is interesting. Erected by the officers and men of the USS Boston in memory of their shipmates who were killed at Mare Island on the 13th of June, 1892. What was that all about? Well, as I, as I read the history of it, there was an explosion. I don't know the, the origin of, of the explosion, but there were a good many people killed, and evidently some uh, were badly injured, and the 
I noticed here in particular that it said that one was a uh, ordinary seaman. Oh yeah, here it is. And in, in the old uh, pecking order in that, it, first you were a, an able seaman, that was the best one. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that went clean up to the top on the masts and the yards. Then, then they had an ordinary seaman which did seaman's work on board the ship. And then they had a third category which they were called landsmen. Landsmen? landsmen. What was that? Landsmen were some of the people perhaps even pressed into service. We call it conscription now, but they were pressed on and they would be picked up and put on the ship to do the, the ordinary duties like holy stoning the deck and uh, washing down, painting on the outside. And the uh, able and ordinary seamen did the sailor type work as we call it. The, the able seamen were the ones that were like the petty officers. When you look around here then, in actuality, this cemetery holds really the whole history part of, of the part development of, of the Navy. It's another, it's another page of the history of the past, yeah. Now we have come to the old... Well, I call it marine country uh -huh. because they, they had their own area in which they, they lived, they trained, and uh, played, I guess you call it. Graduated and shipped out to war. Uh, the, big, the big building over on our left is our marine barracks, and of course you can see the immense parade area, the grinder. And on weekends when they had formal retreats or ceremonies, hey, it was a, it was a, it was a pride to watch. I mean, uh, they come out here on parade, and everything was by the numbers. And when they paraded around, they fired the salute cannons just like they used to do in the old days for ceremony. Now, were the Marines here to guard the shipyard? They, they had at first what we called perimeter security, which was uh, the area around the shipyard. And they had Marines at the gates and at the ferries and all that, and they were replaced by, by police people. Then there were the Marines that were being trained, and then they had Marines for internal security, and the civilians had the perimeter security. And it, Kept, just kept shifting about. These are Marine officers' quarters over, over on our And left. see, they're moving out now. There are no Marines, zero, on base at this time. Now we have come to... Building 84 and 84A, which is the notorious Naval Prison. The Naval Prison? Naval Prison. This is where the, the bad violators were put. Uh huh. It was run by a special detachment of Marines. And among other things, they ran, they ran a, a, a dairy, a, a, a herd of prize cows with the prisoners from this place. Really? But now, was this a historic prison? I mean, was this here from the earliest days? You talk to anybody that's been in the Navy from 1918 on, and they'll just say 84, and they'll tell you where it was and what it was. Really? This is the old brick section. This area here to your right, was, you can tell by the architecture that it was new. The old brick section is the original prison. Boy, I tell you what, it's all boarded up now. You can't, you can't get in. Of course, the problem back then is you couldn't get out. Yeah, yeah. Getting in was easy. Getting out was tough. The next stop on our tour took us to a group of very old buildings. In fact, some of the oldest in the shipyard. Now, these buildings from the earliest days were also under tight security for obvious reasons. Now this is amazing, 1857, and what is that carved out of? Sandstone, that's out of sandstone, native sandstone, and you can tell by the way the tops of the wings are broken off, and a piece of the piece on this side and this side has swallowed off. It's all well, sand. It's been there 140 years. Well, what? It has the advantage of being on the lee side of the building. You see, this is the weather side the other side of the building, or it probably wouldn't be there at all. What was this? This was the original magazine? Uh, for Farragut, must have been. Uh, because you think about three years after he landed, he had to have some place to store his ordnance. And uh, in, you know, I look at the size of the doors and what was stored in there wasn't very large. So it must have been powder for the smooth bore cannons and gunpowder of a type, and it was usually put in kegs. So they evidently had brought it in and stored that kind of ordnance in inside and the cannonballs which went all the way from uh, three inch, four inch, six inch and that and I noticed in Olin Park they had a nine inch, nine inch bore and that's a pretty good cannonball. So the cannonballs would have been in here as well? No, I don't think so. I think well, they look, they've got up there, I'm just looking, they've got cannonballs with flames coming out of the top. 
Look at that. And over here, they've got powder kegs. Well, yeah, of course, the, the powder ignited and launched, right. launched the cannonballs, but they Aren't were all... those cannonballs yeah, over there? Yeah, on, but on, those were for shore batteries, and they had furnaces, and they took those cannonballs and heated them red hot and then fired them at the ships, and all they had to do was land on board ship, and you had a, a three-alarm fire. And look out here. This is all original stuff, too. Except uh, A2 came, did come later, but in looking at uh, 1857, uh, that was before the dry docks, before the cemetery. And so evidently Farragut was looking well ahead when he needed or, or built a, an ordnance storehouse. So from the earliest days, the ordnance, the idea of having these, these uh, warehouses, warehouses, magazines, I guess magazines yeah. was an important part of the, the whole shipyard. It had to be, and I would suppose in those days with the cannonballs, the smoother they are, the more accurate they were, so they'd keep them from getting uh, dusty, rusty, or uh, weather-worn, and look, they would store them. But the size, the size of those, this is what, uh, they, they couldn't have been very big unless they had some kind of a dolly and they put a, a ramp out here and they roll their cannonballs inside. Boy, this was, see, this was made, boy, that is thick. This was made to protect against any kind of a blast. I, I think they were originally designed with a soft top, so if they blasted, they would go up rather than a, across. Most, most of the buildings seem to have corrugated iron. Boy, this is something. Our day on Mare Island was certainly a day of contrast, just like the island itself. Because during our tour, we saw the kind of sights you'd expect to see on a naval shipyard. Things like industrial buildings and huge cranes and dry docks. But we also drove down roads that could have been out in the middle of the country, walked down tree-lined residential streets, and through parks filled with historic Old Navy memorabilia. And we visited St. Peter's Chapel, built in 1901, and one of the loveliest and most poignant places on the entire island. This is a wonderful little chapel. A lovely little chapel? Yeah. It's the oldest Navy chapel in the United States. It's even older than the one in Annapolis because that one had to be rebuilt. So this gets first prize. The oldest Navy chapel in the United States. Right. It also was the first one that it was used for both Catholic and Protestants. It's truly ecumenical. Oh, look. Isn't this impressive? This is just beautiful. It's been here for 94 years. Now, what are these plaques in the ceiling all about? Well, each one is different. Each one had to be approved by a committee, I presume. And they tell the history of the Navy. They honor people ships like the Thresher. Uh, some of them honor a man and a ship because sometimes a, a ship was named for a man. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy, of course, was in the Navy as our commander-in-chief. And the Nimitz, there's one for Nimitz. Uh, in memory, look, here's one. In memory of those who served in submarines during World War II. The last one to go up is this one to McDougal. And McDougal family have great roots here. The skipper of the little boat that Farragut lived on for uh, several months, actually almost two years, was a McDougal. He came back later to be the CO twice. And these windows, Tiffany these windows. wonderful windows? Tiffany windows, all designed by Tiffany, and 17 of them are executed by him, by his workmen. Really? Yeah. The most impressive one is all of that one. And at this time of the night, I think it's just beautiful. There's no artificial lighting. What you see is what natural light comes through. And what has happened in here over the years since 1901? Untold weddings, baptisms, funerals, many, many important things in the life of the Navy. Most of the chairs and the other accoutrements that we see here were made by Mare Island workmen, craftsmen here on the yard. So from the very beginning, there's been a real sense of pride in this chapel. Yes, very much. People take great pride in it, and it is pretty much open now to people to come, but for a long time it was restricted just to Navy people, or military people, I should mm -hmm. say. Well, were traditionally men of the sea religious people? You yes. think of men of the sea as kind of 
a raucous bunch, especially in the early days. I guess when you get out there on the sea and those waves are pounding, you probably get religion pretty fast. Yeah. I would think so. Yes, it was not all unusual for the whole crew and all the officers to come here for church before they went to the last sail. And you were telling me something else that happens in this chapel that is part of the Navy tradition. At the services, at the end of the services, they sing the Navy hymn, which starts out, Eternal Father, strong to save, whose hand doth. It's, it's part of the tradition. And last Sunday was the last Catholic service here. And I was outside listening to it, and I got all weepy just listening to it. But it's a very meaningful prayer and a hymn. And it's by tradition we have that the last thing every Sunday. We ended our tour by climbing up to the highest point on the island for a spectacular panoramic view of this grand old shipyard, which for over 140 years played such an important role in our nation's naval history. Many of the people in Vallejo and others, they look at Mare Island and they see the cranes, uh, the buildings, uh, the powerhouse smokestack, but that wasn't really Mare Island. Mare Island was the people the people that started here and worked here and built the ships, both civilian and military. That's Mare Island, and it's slowly but surely fading into the sunset. What comes later, no one really knows, but we will always be a part of Mare Island. Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed this adventure. If you'd like to see it again, or share it with your family or friends, or perhaps donate a copy to your local school or library, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727, and we'll be glad to send it to you right away.